When I was, I think, about 13 years old, I got my first weekend job, and it was in um, a, a nearby factory packing eggs. One day, the conveyor belts broke, and we had to go into the actual hen shed to go and collect the eggs. And I, I was completely horrified. There was cages going to the top of the, of the room, packed full of birds that were featherless and bleeding. And there was, on the floor, dead birds lying there. And the smell of ammonia was just completely overwhelming. I had no idea until that point that we did this to animals to produce food. From that day forward, I campaigned hard, as you do at 13, telling everybody not to eat eggs from battery hens. And of course, I was humoured a little bit and nobody really listened. And I don't think much has changed, to be honest. It wasn't until years later, with salmonella outbreaks and uh, bird flu, that people started to take the, the thing a little bit more seriously because it was affecting their potential health. There's some amazing, passionate people out there that make a lot of difference in the world, and a lot of them are here today. But there's also a lot of people who just won't make a change until their lives are directly affected. I discovered Alan Savory's work many years ago, about the same time as I was invited to join. Um, the, the Prince of Wales has a, a wonderful school, summer school for sustainable farming and food production. And I attended that and was influenced by Alan Savory and everything started to become clear. My kind of mission in life, if you like, my, my work started to become uh, obvious. I think holistic management and regenerative agriculture could be the most important tool for saving our desperately sick planet and feeding our enormous world population. But to get more farmers to manage their land in a regenerative way and to treat animals better, we have to create the demand for the products that they're going to be able to sell, potentially. Farms are businesses after all. And we also need to have people qualified on the ground to help them make that change. We're you guys come in, obviously. But I think, ironically, our poor health caused in large part due to modern farming could be the lever that we need to get people to listen to our cause. I've spent many years researching, learning and writing about ancestral health and healing foods that I've discovered, as you will, um, that these healing foods from healthy animals reared on healthy soils are some of the most powerful medicine available to us for getting sick people back to health. And as for igniting this consumer revolution, Stephen and I set up Primal Meats for this very cause, so we're very, very ready. So I'll talk about a lot of different things, but today I'm talking about health. Uh, why animal foods are important in maintaining health, and why animal foods grown on healthy soils are considerably more nutritious and superior to those reared in conventional ways. The physiology of humans clearly shows that we're designed to eat meat. It's beyond question. We are 95 to 98.5% genetically identical to chimpanzees. But about 6 million years ago, we started to evolve in different directions. And in this time, Homo sapiens brains have increased by 300%. So what's happened to our bodies that we can power our brains that take up to 25% of our daily energy? Well, the development of tools by early humans to crack open big animal bones, including the brain cavity, allowed us to access nutrient-dense marrow and brain effectively. And the development of tools for slicing meat allowed us to chew the flesh more easily and quickly. These two significant breakthroughs accelerated the quality and density of the nutrition that we could assimilate in a day into our bodies. It can take up to 80% of a large primate's daytime activity, sourcing, chewing, and digesting the foods that they're foraging. The this plant matter is, is full of cellulose, and it's um, certainly nothing like the, uh, the apples and melons that you might find in Tesco's today. These seemingly simple advances allowed us to reduce the amount of bulky plant matter that we had to try and digest and find in a day, and allowed our digestive tracts to shrink, allowing our brains to grow. Essentially, it turned us from big-bellied creatures on hands and feet into upright people with six-packs and a spear. 
Cooking, it seems, was also an enormous contributing factor to pre-humans getting more nutrients in less time and allowing us to grow the big brains that we have today. Gently cooking unlocks nutrition and up to 100% of um, a cooked meal is metabolised into the body, digested. Whereas only about 30 to 40% of a raw food is digested. <coughs> but when it comes to meat, it's a lot to do with how you cook it. When meats cook gently for a long time, instead of uh, an overcooked tangle mess of hard to digest amino acids, the long protein chains stay in orderly lines. And the moisture in the meat, especially in slow cooking methods, allows the, the, um, the long pro the peptide bonds to be clipped neatly into little tiny peptide segments. And this is our bodies are able to digest this a lot more effectively. And in a, a fantastic work of nature, these tiny little peptide segments are um, also um, easily put into our tiny little taste bud receptors, which are, um, are, uh, make us perceive the food as tastier. And that's the origin of umami foods. In fatty cuts of meat with um, lots of connective tissue, the water maintained within the slow cooking methods allows a family of molecules to be drawn out, which are called glycosaminoglycans. And you might be familiar with uh, some of those, which are up on the screen, um, chondroitin sulfate, um, glucosamine, and hyaluronic acid. And these are well known for helping with joint health. But in some studies on rheumatoid arthritis, it was shown that um, when you compared the natural food alternative, i.e. collagen and gelatin, um, with the tablet form, the, the, the natural animal food was much more effective in helping rheumatoid arthritis. Now, when we um, fry or grill muscle meat, it tends to char and burn. And this um, process um, reacts with some of the amino acids like creatine and produces harmful compounds potentially harmful compounds. And in animal studies, it's been shown to induce cancer in quite a, a range, actually. But of course, we have to be careful applying animal studies to humans. But there is a likelihood that it will be transferable to, to some degree. So I would always recommend um, long, gentle, slow cooking is far superior, and I certainly try and limit your burnt foods. Currently, we're at an incredibly fortunate point in time, and we have real life hunters and gatherers still walking our earth, as well as access to some amazing scientific uh, work from people like Weston A. Price. And he studied indigenous cultures and traditional cultures before and after where they were influenced by the West. What's really clear is that this idea that we have some perfect diet that's fit for all humans across the world is a total myth. Both throughout evolution and still today, different parts of the world offer up different foods and we've adapted incredibly well throughout the world to, to uh, eating them and, and maintain really robust health. What seems to be the, the driving factor behind the onset of the diseases of westernisation is the introduction of modern foods such as refined grains, sugars, processed foods, tinned foods and of course all of the lifestyle habits that uh, would uh, be adopted as well. And of course our farming methods Wild foods moving to farming is one step, but then, of course, industrialised farming is a whole different big step. There aren't any essential foods, but there are essential nutrients. And traditional diets vary hugely, but the important nutrients found exclusively in animal foods meant that all traditional cultures included at least some animal foods in their diet. Animal-free animal food, animal foods um, diets are virtually devoid of vitamin B12, calcium, iron, zinc, the long chain fatty acids EPA and DHA, and the fat soluble vitamins A and D. Some people think you can get adequate B12 intake through um, certain plant sources such as brewer's yeast, seaweed, spirulina, spirulina and uh, fermented soy. But it turns out that um, it turns out that the sources of B12 in these foods are actually B12 analogues and they're kind of a pseudo B12 which jumps in and acts on behalf of B12 and in actual fact increases the need to um, eat more true B12. Studies um, comparing vegans with uh, omnivores showed that most vegans are deficient in calcium, not just because they're not eating the calcium rich foods 
of animals, but because the plant foods that they're eating tend to have um, a lot of anti-nutrients such as oxalates and phytates. And that actually blocks the absorption of minerals, including calcium. Similar story with iron deficiency. The intake levels of iron are very similar, but the types of food we're eating offer up different ways of digesting it. Heme iron in animal foods is very digestible. Plant food iron isn't digestible. There's a very small conversion ratio rate. Mm. Um, and of course, they, they also have very high amounts of absorption inhibitors, which are blocking the absorption of the minerals. Same story with zinc. You compare um, vegans and omnivores, and the intake levels are very similar, but the actual amount of the zinc being assimilated into the body is very low. EPA and DHA are two omega-3 essential fatty acids found nearly exclusively in fish and um, animal foods, uh, really only in offal meats. These long chain fatty acids can help protect against diseases such as cancer, asthma, depression, cardiovascular disease, ADHD, autoimmune diseases. Really important and essential to us. Plants contain some omega-3, but it's in the form of alpha linoleic acid. And some of this can be converted into DHA and EPA, but the conversion rates are tiny, about 5 to 10 percent. Also, the successful conversion into EPA and DPA relies on synergistic nutrients such as zinc and iron, which we've just said are not very high if you're not eating animal foods. Also, a critical factor is how many omega-6 fatty acids you're eating. If your diet includes a lot of seeds, nuts, vegetable oils, margarines, grains, and grain-fed meats, you'll be eating a lot of omega-6 fatty acids. And that will interfere with the successful conversion of ALA into DHA and EPA. Our perfect ratio is, um, is one to one. And grass-finished meats, grass-fed and finished meats, tend to have a, a relatively equal percentage of omega-3 to omega-6 in their diets, um, in, in the food that's produced. And um, traditional cultures would have had a, a similar one to one ratio, because omega-6 and omega-3 use the same metabolic pathways. So Essentially, omega-6 will outcompete omega-3. And in modern cultures, and especially those without meats in them, or eating grain-fed meats, will be eating somewhere in the region of 1 to 20, or 1 to 30 even, if in a very poor diet. So we're not benefiting from any of the omega-3s that are being eaten. There's a, a really, really special fat <coughs> out there called conjugated linoleic acid, so CLA. And it's really only fed in the, uh, found in the meat and milk and butter of grass-fed animals, particularly grass-finished animals. And it could be one of the most healthful and, and potent anti-cancer nutrients in our diet now. CLA has been proven to, even in small amounts, block all three stages of cancer, unlike a lot of the other um, anti-cancer nutrients, which only help in one stage. CLA seems to be hugely anti-inflammatory, which will help in a whole range of disorders as well as cancer. And it's even stable throughout cooking, so we're not, you know, not need to be too concerned about that either. You can buy CLA in capsule form, but um, it seems to lack the beneficial form. And it's also been shown to potentially be harmful and disruptive to insulin, sort of successful insulin production. Diets absent of animal foods are nearly entirely devoid of fat-soluble vitamins A and D. And these are critical activators to human health. They're found mainly in seafood, organ meats, uh, eggs and dairy. Vitamin A got a, has a critical role in maintaining healthy vision, neurological function and healthy skin. And apart from certain hard-to-find mushrooms which contain vitamin D, most plant foods don't contain either A or D. And uh, most, some plants um, contain carotenoids, which are a precursor to vitamin A, but again, the conversion rate is very low. To get the same amount of vitamin E, A, sorry, vitamin A, um, as a small portion of liver, you would have to eat 14 cups of carrots. Um, vitamin D levels, <laughs> which is fine, but you won't be able to eat anything else afterwards. <laughs> 
Vitamin D levels have been shown to be 74% lower in vegans and omnivores. And the deficiency is linked to increased risks of developing cancer, autoimmune disease, hypertension, and some infectious diseases. In 1945, Weston A. Price discovered, through the chemical testing of organ meats and dairy products and eggs, um, that were eaten by, eaten by exceptionally healthy traditional cultures, an unknown fat-soluble activator co he called um, Activator X. He discovered that the nutrient was present in far higher quantities in the animal products of um, those been eating really good quality pastures, particularly at high level, and in summer. He felt that uh, the nutrient played a hugely important and influential role in the absorption of minerals, and particularly in, he felt, it was the reason why traditional cultures that he'd studied had near perfect dental health, as you can see here, wide dental arches and wonderful bone development. A growing body of scientific work now confirms that that mysterious activator was the vitamin K2. And... Um, and it's, as I say, present really only in um, grass-fed animal fatty foods. Vitamin K2 gets calcium into your bones. And essentially, eating calcium without K2 is a bit of a waste of time. And it could even be harmful, especially if you're supplementing calcium, because all of this calcium has to go somewhere. And if it's not being absorbed into your bones, it could end up um, accelerating plaque formation in your arteries and forming kidney stones. And apart from fermented soya um, and some fermented vegetables, K2 isn't in plants. It's, uh, and, and of course, in the fermented food, it actually comes from the bacteria, the animals, in that, that process. Vitamin K1 is found in leafy green vegetables, but has a very low conversion rate to, to K2. And also K1 and K2 seem to form um, to have different functions in the body. So it's now pretty mainstream knowledge, I would say, that the information that we've been getting about saturated fat and cholesterol from our health professionals over the last uh, 20, 30 years has been at best misguided and at worst totally wrong. What we don't know is how much of this was due to the high levels of um, vitamin A, D and K2 and CLA that were traditionally ate eaten by you know, traditional cultures, which is why they didn't develop heart disease on these foods. So the, the, it's very complex and you have to be very careful about jumping to conclusions and then uh, suddenly telling everybody it's safe to eat butter and you know, we can get away with eating saturated fat. It could mean that there's a big difference between animal fats that are you know, from animals reared on grass and animal fats from you know, industrial systems. Our depleted soils are now producing vegetables that are considerably lower in nutrients than when our grandparents were uh, benefiting from the, the local vegetables they would have been eating. And certainly our meats um, contain only a, only a shadow of the nutrients that our ancestors, particularly you know, early ancestors, would have been eating with wild foods and pastured animals. In one study, cows grazing pasture and receiving no supplemental feed had CLA, 500% um, more CLA in their milk fat than a typical dairy cow would produce from a typical dairy diet. Another study by Bristol University on lamb showed that the essential fatty acid profile in the meat produced um, increased drastically when the diversity of the pasture was improved. So uh, Heather Moorland, I think, came out the best. Numerous studies from around the world conclude that animals eating a natural diet, a pasture-based diet in, the t you know, in terms of ruminants, um, on healthy soils will produce meat, milk and eggs that are higher in just about all of the nutrients. <coughs> our genetics have been moulded by our behaviours and for hundreds of thousands of years we would have eaten the whole animal. <coughs> Our fear of fat and obsession with quick cooking has led us into eating a lot of muscle meats and lean meats in particular, but that could be damaging our health. In a diet with a lot of lean, clean meats, um, a person will be ingesting a lot of the amino acid methionine, which is not bad in itself, but diets high in methionine um, can r lead to a, a rise in plasma homocysteine. 
And homocysteine levels are used as an index of susceptibility to disease. So that's a bad thing. The good news is that if you eat all the bits of an animal, <laughs> um, including the skin, the offal, connective tissue, joints, um, you'll get the full range of amino acids and it all naturally balances out. These will include a huge amount of glycine, which is a, a neutralizing, has a neutralizing effect on homocysteine. Also, you'll get a lot of B vitamins as well, and again, that has a neutralizing effect on the homocysteine in your, in your plasma. And of course, you wouldn't have to think about this. It would have just naturally happened if you were eating and utilizing the whole animal. Have you ever wondered why, if you keep hens, you'll know this, that often the fox will go in and take the heads and leave the bodies, and it seems like it's a terrible, wasteful thing to do from evil animals, but in actual fact, they know that the nutrition most important bit of nutrition is in, in the brain. And offal meats offer, by comparison to muscle meat, so much more nutrition, it's just overwhelming. But they've all gone out of fashion, unfortunately. Organ meat can even be a rich source of vitamin C in the absence of plant foods. And the Inuit knew this in, intuitively and prized the adrenal gland of a moose to ward off scurvy. And in recent studies, they've shown that, in fact, that has exceptionally high levels of vitamin C. So they just knew this intuitively. And most traditional cultures include at least some raw offal in their diet, which I don't fancy much myself. But we do have some committed customers who do uh, raw liver smoothies. <laughs> it's important when eating any meat, and especially organ meats, to try and go for... Um, foods that are from an organic system because the, um, the pollutants, the toxins, the pesticides and the medicines used in modern farming can bioconcentrate in the fats and organs of an animal. So you don't want to be eating that. I feel it's really important to honour an animal when you kill it for food. And it, a part of that is eating every bit of it and making sure that it's all valued equally. And as a meat business, I can tell you that you can't make a profit unless you sell all the bits of an animal. It's a really critical part of it, which we heard about earlier, I'm glad to say. What happens is if you can't sell all of the bits of the animal, you end up going direct to wholesalers, and then you just ask for the bits that you can sell, and you end up losing all of the provenance, and you certainly lose the ability to be able to influence that farming. But if you're like me and you're not keen on eating um, liver smoothies, um, try some traditional foods like haggis or black pudding or steak and kidney pie or there's loads of ways of getting really nutritious foods into your diet without sort of knowing about it quite so much. <laughs> Just as we're beginning to understand the complex and totally astonishing world of the microorganisms that are living in healthy soils, we're starting to realise how important our gut flora is to our health as humans. A teaspoonful of productive soil generally contains between 100 million and a billion microorganisms. That's as much, much mass as two cows per acre. It's huge. In healthy soils, the soil biota and plants have a, an incredibly complex relationship that's beneficial to each other. The plants will thrive because all of the little critters have broken down the soil into a form that the nutrients can be absorbed easily from. And the plants can access the full range of nutrients because of this interplay between all of the different soil biota. It's, it's amazing, the, the, the fungi and everything, they're all passing nutrients back and forth to each other. And it of, often, um, because of all the activity around the root ball in particular, it protects against pathogenic threats too. All of those wonderful minerals are being passed up into the plant and then of course anything that eats it is benefiting from all those minerals and vitamins too including us eventually. In our guts, a similar exchange is happening. We feed the bacteria, and that allows us to access the nutrients in a, in a better way. And um, it protects us from, if we keep our bacteria healthy, it protects us from pathogenic threats too. Our guts contain 100 trillion bacteria. And maintaining, maintaining the number and diversity of this is critical to overall health. And our food choices in the environment can really influence how healthy our gut flora is. Also, our gut flora and bacteria can help us adapt to eating huge variations in, in macronutrients across the world. 
um, which could be a really important part of sustainability into the future when we're sh having food shortages and having to adapt to eating what's available. But when we dress the soils with pesticides, um, fungicides and uh, herbicides, and we shake on a lot of fertilizer, we kill the life in the soils. And also the food that's coming into our homes from these soils is laced with um, toxic bacteria exterminating you know, residues. Glyphosate is the number one herbicide throughout the world. And ingesting glyphosate is hugely disruptive to the life cycle and function of your gut bacteria, even in really small doses. It's compromising your ability to extract nutrients and it's, um, it's definitely harming your main defence against potential pathogens. We can't wash it off and it doesn't break down in cooking. And research by Friends of the Earth um, has detected glyphosate residues in 44% of urine samples tested from across 18 European countries, so that's not even the US. <coughs> Industrial studies show that when livestock are fed glyphosate um, that will just come in feeds that are non-organic, um, the residues are that are found in those feeds are passing through the gut um, barrier and coming through into the organ meats and um, eggs and milk of those animals, so we're ingesting it that way too. And of course, glyphosate is just one of the many toxins used in farming nowadays that will just about guarantee to be having some impact on our health and our gut flora. And when we moved away from eating traditional foods and increased our consumption of processed foods and sugars and refined carbohydrates and being exposed to all of these nasty chemicals, we saw a profound drop in human health. <coughs> Western Price... Um, study this in indigenous and traditional cultures throughout the world, so he's, he's got a really broad scope of lots of different places throughout the world, but he studied the people of Lewis in Scotland, and um, he studied them before and after they were influenced by all the um, modern processed foods that were gradually being brought onto the island, and he noticed a huge drop in health, and the, the people on the left had been eating a traditional diet of oats, homegrown oats and they had this amazing system of taking the thatch off and using it as fertility on the soil so it was really fertile soil and they ate a lot of fish and fish offal um, and a bit of barley and some meats and milk but uh, generally it was homegrown nothing else was influenced by the outside world and then in about a 50 year period it suddenly changed over to processed foods, tinned food, sugars brought in on the boats and in that same period of time the uh, Scottish Government health records show that the average height of people in Scotland dropped by four inches. And with this uh, shrinking height became, came the, the diseases of civilization that you just don't get in primitive and um, traditional cultures such as heart disease, stroke, obesity, diabetes type 2, Alzheimer's, arthritis, you name it. It came around that time. Often the end result from eating all of these modern foods and living in a modern way is that the delicate lining of our small intestine becomes damaged and it becomes permeable or leaky. When your gut becomes leaky, the um, small intestine, the irritated small intestine, allows metabolic and microbial toxins to go straight through into your bloodstream. Our bodies, because they're clever, quite rightly, um, mount an immune response and tag these foods through specific antigen um, antibody markers as foreign irritants. Under these circumstances, our liver, endocrine system, lymphatic system and immune response become compromised. And this can lead to the some of the most serious diseases, autoimmune diseases. Now every time you eat this particular food, you'll have an inflammatory response to it, which is a food allergy or a food intolerance. And some of the most likely causes for these are dairy, gluten, grains, corn, beans, especially soy, and nuts. Now, I could go into the food processing methods of any one of those foods, and the story will be pretty similar. Um, it comes from depleted soils. It's uh, highly modified um, species that we don't even recognize. Um, industrial processing methods that take out, strip out all of the nutrients and then lots of toxic additives and preservatives. Certainly that's the conventional food that you're likely to be getting. That's what's going to be happening to it. I often wonder why on earth anybody questions the increased rise in 
intolerances and allergies throughout uh, the Western world nowadays, our bodies don't realise the food we're eating is food. It just doesn't recognise it. I know my customers pretty well, and um, one of the leading health conditions they have and why they look for a meat company like ours is because they have this perm perm gut permeability issues with their gut, which has often led to other diseases. And certainly a high proportion of our customer base are ex-vegetarians or vegans because they want to find the next best ethical option when they're including foods, animal foods. And as it turns out, and it's becoming much more um, well known now, particularly in the functional medicine world, that collagen found in um, animal joints and bones is the number one tool for healing gut permeability. Removing the allergens and the intolerances, taking those food out of the diet and then um, you know, eating lots of nourishing bone broths and meats which have got a lot of gelatinous sort of, you know, all sorts of jointy bits and slow cooking meats, they're really, really healthy for helping to heal and seal our digestive tract. Now, our obsession with reductionist conclusions will no doubt take us down some more dark alleys on the road, you know, to finding perfect health. And I certainly try really hard to um, think much more holistically about health instead of relying on the next scientific study to draw conclusions. And the more I learn about nutrition, the more I'm in awe of how nature has packaged all these foods together in these um, full of complementary nutrients and activators that science can't even begin to understand. And I'm ever more respectful of the wisdom and knowledge that our ancestors could have passed down to us if we hadn't thought we were so clever and listened to science instead. Everybody's different and every part of the world is different. Each farm has different soils and every animal can have vary in health. There's no simple solution and we all need to take our own journey to find perfect health. This talk only scratches the surface of this subject and I talk about this a lot in my writing and do webinars and other things. And of course health is so much more than just food. All the nourishing food in the world won't cure you if you live in a toxic building, get no exercise, you're stressed, you don't get into the sunshine or in nature. And, uh, you know, it's a really important thing to think of it all holistically. <laughs> There's a template for, I'm going to put up in a second, a template for um, healthy foods that have been eaten by our cultures throughout a long time. And they allowed people to be extremely healthy while eating these foods. And it's a really good place to start. It's from Weston Price, and their work is really very good at um, having a baseline for starting to find your own path. But it's really clear from all of it that one of the most important factors in getting the right nutrients is to source foods from healthy plants and animals growing on healthy soils. So let's all get behind this consumer revolution and by healing our bodies through eating real foods, we can improve the life of farm animals and hopefully heal the planet too. Thanks very much. <laughs>